you might be wondering why the first uh, slide in my PowerPoint is this young lady. Um, uh, boy, I'm having all kind of. I saw this painting on Facebook and I really liked it. And I've discovered that I knew the artist and I contacted her and asked her if I could buy it. And I named the painting Ethel. And the reason I did that is that studies show and common sense would tell you that if you uh, are given frequent reminders, you can stay on track to be ethical. So she hangs in my living room. I see her every day. And she's my constant reminder to be ethical. And I'll talk more about her later. It was March 19th of 2003. I was living in Fairhope, Alabama, which is very near uh, Mobile, and it was about time for the evening news to come on, and I went into my den. I turned on NBC out of Mobile, and the announcer said, we opened tonight's news with a breaking story out of Birmingham, Alabama. Massive accounting fraud uncovered at Health South. It's estimated that there's almost three billion dollars worth of bogus numbers on their books. At that moment, I knew I would probably in the not too distant future be in prison. How did it all begin? I first met Richard Scrushy in the summer of 1980. Now, can y'all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Ah, now I'm back on the screen. You can see Ethel over my shoulder there. So I knew that I would probably be in prison uh, in the not too distant future. How did it all begin? I first met Richard Scrushy in the summer of 1980. I was living in Houston, Texas, and I'd recently passed the CPA exam. And I was at a point in my career where I wanted to go to work for a large company. I'd never worked with or for another CPA. So I answered an ad in Houston Chronicle for a controller position at LifeMark Corporation. LifeMark was a for-profit hospital company uh, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And I went in for the interview and the interview was with Richard Scrushy. Uh, some reason my slide won't advance now. Ah, there we are. Can y'all see Richard Scrushy now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I immediately knew that I met somebody very different. All during the interview, my head was just spinning and I was, I was dazzled by the guy. And by the end of the interview, I was totally convinced that uh, that was the best job I could possibly have in Houston, Texas. So, uh, but as I was driving home, I kept thinking about the guy. And by the time I got home, I told my wife that I thought I'd met the most brilliant businessman I would ever meet, or maybe the biggest con artist I would ever meet. Richard offered me the job. I reported to work and I'd just been at my desk for about five minutes. And Richard came in and said, Aaron, I'm a, uh, about to present a contract to my boss and it's a contract I think we should sign. I'd like for you to sit in on my presentation. So we went into his boss's office. He introduced me and he said, Aaron and I worked on this contract for hours last night. <laughs> I hadn't worked on anything. I just walked in the front door. Today, after everything that's happened, I truly believe that he told that lie to size me up. He wanted to see how I would behave being included in a lie. It would tell him a lot about me. I worked for Richard for almost four years and uh, Richard was a respiratory therapist and at LifeMark, he was in charge of the ancillary services of respiratory therapy, physical therapy and pharmacy. And he managed those departments for the company and I was his financial guy. I learned a lot from Richard. Uh, the first thing you learn about Richard though is that he has a big ego. In fact, uh, I'm 77 years old and I've never met a person with a bigger ego than Richard Scrushy. But like I say, I learned a lot from him um, 
he, he taught me how to really operate in a large New York Stock Exchange company. But after working for Richard for almost four years, I came in one morning and my Wall Street Journal was waiting for me on my desk. And the headline was, AMI and LifeMark to merge. AMI was a much larger hospital company out of California. And the article said they'd be closing the offices in Houston, Texas. And once the merger was complete, that was not good news. I did not know if I was going to be part of the merger, and I didn't think I'd want to move to California as part of the merger. But what happens when large companies like this merge, and these were two New York Stock Exchange companies, venture capitalists will come around to see if someone maybe has an idea for a startup company. Citicorp Venture Capital out of San Francisco contacted Bill Mackey, the chairman of the board, and Bill Mackey said, the, your man is Richard Scrooge. He's absolutely brilliant. We made him a full vice president when he was only 26 years old. And he's been talking to us about doing more things outside of the hospital to lower health care costs. Even in the early 1980s, the cost of health care was front page news. And Richard felt like many things being done in hospitals could be done outside of the hospital on an outpatient basis at a much lower cost to setting. He was able to convince this venture capitalist to put a million dollars into a startup company to open a chain of outpatient rehabilitation centers. Now, Richard needed a management team, he needed a CFO, and he wanted me to be the CFO of the new company. And I was kind of ready to get away from Richard. I'd learned that he told lots of white lies, his ego was really kind of oppressive, but he's always a good salesman. He says, Aaron, put in $5,000. You'll get 100,000 shares in the new company. He said, you got to realize Citicorp is paying a dollar a share for their million shares. So your $5,000 is already worth 100000 based on what they're paying. And I knew Richard could build a big company. I, I didn't have a lot of doubt about that. So against my better judgment, I made the decision to go with Richard and his new company. Now, Richard was from uh, Alabama, so he wanted to headquarter the company in Birmingham, Alabama. So we moved there. We opened our first outpatient center, and we tried to make it look like a fitness center or a spa. We did not want the patient to feel like they were going back into a building full of sick people. We charged less than the acute care hospitals did for the same procedures, and it worked. Our first outpatient center made more money than we thought it would. It, it broke even sooner than we thought it would. And uh, from early on, I, I felt like I was really on the ground floor of something pretty exciting. One morning during the uh, first year we were open, I came in and we only had about 10 or 15 people in our corporate office and uh, Richard had gotten there before me and he had drawn this stick figure image of people pulling a wagon. And when everybody got there, he gave us kind of a motivational speech. He said, look, you're not working as a team. You're not all pulling the wagon. He said, the two guys out front holding the handle of the wagon are doing a pretty good job, but some of you are riding in the wagon. Some of you are just on the sidelines looking at the wagon. And I need for you to uh, get, all get out front and pull the wagon. And this became a company motto. And he had this exact crude drawing uh, reproduced and framed and it hung in the lobby of every health cell facility next to a large picture of himself. And at the end of the year, if you were an outstanding employee, you, you got a, uh, maybe 100 shares of stock and you got a little red wagon that was called the Pulling the Wagon Award. In 2009, I wrote a book about HealthSouth and I was trying to come up with a title and my wife said, just call it HealthSouth, The Wagon to Disaster. So I did, I named my book HealthSouth, The Wagon to Disaster. As we started opening these outpatient centers, we noticed that there was need for rehabilitation hospitals in the United States. 
at the time, there were only 57 rehab hospitals in the United States. So we got into that business. Within a few years, it was apparent that outpatient surgery was becoming a big business. So we got into that business. So as we grew HealthSouth, we had three main businesses, outpatient uh, rehab centers, rehab hospitals, and outpatient surgery centers. Within just two years, we were talking to investment bankers about going public. And I think maybe the most important uh, meeting in the history of the company, when you look back at everything that happened, took place with some bankers from a firm called Drexel Burnham. Two of the bankers had flown down to Birmingham to talk to Richard and I about the process of going public. And they spent the entire day with us. And at the end of the day, the lead banker said, look, uh, we like the way your facility looks. Uh, your management team seems sharp. Your business plan is sound. But he said, you're still losing money. Uh, you're what we call a startup company. He said, now, you tell me your centers lose money when you first open them, which is not unexpected, but you're opening a lot of centers. He said, I'm, I'm curious, how are you accounting for those startup losses? And I said, well, we're being conservative and we're expensing our startup losses. No, no, no. Capitalize those costs. Put them on the balance sheet and write them off over several years. If you do, I think you're going to show a profit much sooner and we can take you public. Richard went crazy. Aaron, Aaron, why are you letting the accounting tell wag the dog? I'm out here killing myself trying to get this company public and your silly accounting is hurting the company. I'm embarrassed that this man had to fly down here from New York City and explain something so simple to you. Let me tell you what your job is as a CFO. It's to make the bottom line look good all the time and don't you ever forget that. That was Richard's management style. He didn't mind beating you up in front of people. I redid our numbers. I redid our projections. I redid our accounting. I ran it by our auditors and they said it was okay, but they warned me that uh, this kind of thing can be abused. Don't you guys abuse it. And of course we abused the hell out of it. So starting day one, we were probably putting things on our balance sheet that should have stayed on the P&L. But within less than six months, we were showing a profit and we registered to go public. We registered to sell 2 million shares tentatively priced at uh, eight to $10 a share. And of course, the way the process works, you file with the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, and before your stock starts trading, while they're approving your deal, you go on a roadshow. You go to New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, and Richard was magnificent on the roadshow. Your final roadshow is always in New York City. That's the day before you price your stock, the day before you start trading. And Richard made the presentation and Putnam, Fidelity, all the big mutual funds there at the luncheon. And when he finished, he got a standing ovation and it seemed to go on forever. And the guy sitting next to me, an investor of a, a mutual fund with the mutual fund shaking his head. And he, he finally said, I, I've never seen anything like this. He said, people do not applaud on road shows. And he says, all my years on Wall Street, I've never seen anybody get a standing ovation. He said, the funny thing is, you guys should not be going public. Your company is not even three years old. Your audited top line is only $5 million. You and Richard have no track record that you can run a public company. But he said, you're going to get the deal done because Richard Scrushy is the best salesman I've ever seen on a road show. We did get the deal done. We were not able to get the eight to ten dollars a share. Uh, we had to go out at six fifty, six dollars and fifty cents a share, but we got the deal done. The stock began trading, and with just in a few months, we were well over twenty dollars a share. You can do the arithmetic. I'm now a millionaire. 
I had my 100,000 shares. Uh, I'd also gotten another 50,000 in options uh, at $1 a share. It changed me. Um, it was very exciting going public uh, with my 150,000 shares. Um, like I say, I'm well over a millionaire. When I started the company, I didn't have a net worth of $50,000. As soon as I could, I sold a little stock and I went out and paid cash for a new Mercedes. I'd never paid cash for a car before. I'd never driven a Mercedes. So that was pretty exciting. As the years went by and the stock just went straight up, I built about a 7,000 square foot home in Birmingham, Alabama. I bought a condo in the French Quarter in New Orleans. I uh, had accumulated three beach houses in Florida. Every year I bought a new Porsche or BMW or whatever kind of luxury car I wanted to drive that year. And I noticed as I was flying to New York City uh, for investor conferences and things that the investment bankers all wore very expensive Hermes silk ties. And I bought $30,000 worth of them. So it was, uh, it was exciting. Now, for Richard, the newfound wealth really changed him. I did not realize it, but he had always wanted to be a rock and roll star. So he formed a rock band called Proxy up in the left-hand corner there. And he began playing rock music uh, at company events and at, in bars, wherever he could find a gig. And the band didn't take off like he thought it should. Uh, the problem was he wasn't a very good singer. But he thought, well, maybe I can be a country star. So he went to Nashville. He bought himself a black cowboy hat. He hired people from Sawyer Brown and the Oak Ridge Boys to back him. He produced an album and he wrote a song called Honk If You Love to Honky Tonk. And he sent, he sent out memos nationwide to all of our employees uh, to have them call their radio station and have them play Honk If You Love to Honky Tonk. But he also started always carrying a gun in his briefcase. And as the years went by, he hired bodyguards that followed him everywhere he went. If he went into Walmart at night, there'd be a couple of goons talking into their sleeve as he shopped. But in spite of these things, he was a darling of Wall Street. Six other companies went public doing essentially the same thing we did. Wall Street gave Richard credit for um, not just taking one company public, but starting an entire new niche for healthcare investors to invest in. People in healthcare wanted Richard Scrushy on their board of directors. He was considered a visionary. <coughs> so uh, in spite of these things, uh, he was very much a darling of Wall Street. And he was held in the highest esteem uh, with investors and everything. In fact, he was eventually appointed to the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Now that there were six companies doing what we were doing, we began acquiring those companies. Uh, our stock always traded at a higher value than our competitors, and it was easy for us to um, acquire these companies just with our stock, no cash out. The investment bankers are very good at putting these kind of deals together. Uh, it played right into Richard's big ego. So in the early 1990s, we started uh, doing acquisitions that uh, valued at half a billion, billion dollars. So uh, we became a very large company. We grew very fast. Let me give you the entire timeline. We start the company in 84. We go public in 86. By 1995, we're the largest company in the state of Alabama. We're operating in all 50 states. We have uh, almost 40,000 employees. We own more rehab hospitals, more surgery centers, and more outpatient centers than any other company in the United States. And we're 350th on the Fortune 500 list. I'm a rock star in Birmingham. I could go out to dinner with my wife. People would recognize me. They'd want to come up and talk to me. Um, they'd want to buy me a drink. Uh, I always thought it kind of odd that people want to buy rich people stuff, but 
I let them buy me a drink. It was quite the deal. The company started taking on some of Richard's big personality. We uh, started buying jet airplanes, which Richard learned to fly. By 1995, we owned 12 jets, two Gulf Streams, which are about $40 million airplanes. A typical day for Richard and I would be to go to our hangar, get on our Gulf Stream, fly up to Teterboro Airport in New Jersey. On the way up, somebody would prepare us breakfast. We'd land in Teterboro, there'd be a helicopter waiting for us. We'd fly into Manhattan, there'd be a limo waiting for us. We'd go to Trump Towers or the Plaza Hotel, wherever, and meet with investors. That night, we'd fly back home. Uh, we'd never have to stop in Atlanta. Uh, you have to live in the South and I fly Delta a lot to understand why that's slightly amusing, but uh, it was quite the deal. You might say, wow, what a success story. Two guys with no real wealth start a company Less than 10 years, they're a Fortune 500 company, they're multimillionaires, what could go wrong? One word really, and that word is greed. We were very greedy. And a lot of, when you talk about frauds and ethics, um, if you ask the average guy on the street, why do people commit fraud? They'll say greed, people are greedy, so they cheat. And in large part, that is true, but many times people uh, commit frauds, get entangled in things, and it's not putting money directly into their pocket. But in this case, greed, particularly in the case of Richard Scrooge, was the motivating factor. Around 1995, Richard told the media that on television, in the newspapers, that he wanted to be a billionaire. He said, I want to be the richest man in the state of Alabama. And I estimated in 1995 that he was worth about $600 million. In 1997, he was the highest paid executive in the United States. He took home $110 million in that one year. That's a lot of money. Nick Saban, LeBron James, they make a lot of money, but they don't come close to making $110 million in one year. Now, Richard totally controlled his board of directors. They were totally yes men. He gave them stock options. He paid them well. He let them fly around in their, their air, jet airplanes and they would do anything he asked for because he, he was the man. And he asked for millions, I mean millions of stock options every year. And he understood that if the stock could keep going up with his millions of options, he would probably in pretty short time be a billionaire. Now, he would meet with the stock analysts every year and ask them, what do we need to earn next year for you to keep your strong body on our stock? And they would tell him. And he would always say, we can do that. That's not a problem. It didn't matter what our projections said we were gonna do. He simply promised Wall Street record earnings year after year. Now, it really wasn't a problem the first three, four, maybe five years. We were a very good company. We were making lots of money. And it wasn't a matter of, of uh, being profitable. We were very profitable. Our best basic business strategy was to align ourselves with the best orthopedic surgeons in the country. In Birmingham, Dr. Jim Andrews practiced at our hospital. He is today and certainly has been the most outstanding orthopedic surgeon in the United States. He did Bo Jackson's hip, Corey Aikman's shoulder. Uh, he's the one that told the New Orleans Saints that Drew Brees could still throw the football. And we had a great reputation. But over time, it became difficult to hit the earnings that Richard was promising Wall Street. So I started doing what I eventually told the FBI was aggressive accounting. As you may be aware, in accounting, there's lots of uh, estimating. It's not that scientific. <clears throat> you have to estimate what your bad debts are. And that's a really tricky area in healthcare in particular. 
because you have discounts with HMOs, Medicare, Medicaid, you have lots of bad debts. So I started changing our estimates for bad debts and any other thing that I could, they were estimatable to improve the bottom line. It worked for a while, but over time, analysts started noticing that our cash flow and earnings didn't seem to match. So the stock began to trade down some. But in the summer of 1996, after being a public company for 10 years and never missing Wall Street expectations, we'd missed them pretty badly. My chief accountant, Bill Owens, and I just felt like we couldn't keep doing the accounting of the way we were doing it. People were starting to notice that we were doing some pretty crummy accounting. So we prepared ourselves to go into Richard's office and tell him that we had to report numbers below street expectations. The first time uh, in 10 years of being a public company that we would miss earnings. I knew it was gonna be a little, as much fun as telling him that he couldn't sing, but we went into his office, we laid it out. His face turned red, he started trembling. Get out of my office. Have you guys lost your minds? We are not going to report numbers below street expectations. If we do, the stock's going to crash. We're going to be sued. Your stock options will be worthless. You won't be the rock stars in Birmingham anymore. He said, here's the problem. You guys have gotten lazy. You know how to fix these numbers. You've done it before. Get back into your office and get these numbers where where they need to be. And he wouldn't let us leave. He just kept screaming at us, telling us that we could not report numbers below street expectations. Finally, Bill Owens, my chief accountant, who had worked for our auditors, said, look, we have 1,500 sets of books. He said, I can make entries small enough and spread them through those 1,500 sets of books and I will get the numbers to where they need to be. And the auditors won't look at these entries because I will keep them small enough not to attract their attention. But he said, now, Richard, Aaron, I'll be crediting revenue we never generated, and on the balance sheet, I'll be debiting assets we do not have. Richard thought about it for a moment. Finally, he said, guys, this is our best option. We'll only do it this one time. Employees won't lose their jobs. Stockholders won't get hurt. And you guys know everybody does this kind of thing. At that point, I should have had the courage to stand up to Richard and say no. But I'm telling you, I was a coward. I was intimidated by Richard. I knew he had a gun in his briefcase. I did not want to be the one to cause his net worth to go down by several hundred million dollars. So that night, I let Bill Owens cook the books. The next day, when I went into work, I felt like people are staring at me. I felt like I had blood on my hands. I did not understand or did not anticipate what this would do to my life. But from that day forward, I was, I was miserable. We weren't making accounting changes, making es changing estimates. We were trick just making up numbers. We did it again the next quarter. 1996 ended. The auditors did not detect the fraud bills. Very clever. 1997 was beginning. And we pled with Richard to tell the analysts that we were going to have a bit of a down year. Or we wouldn't be losing money, but we wouldn't earn as much as we had been earning in the past. He would not do it. He promised the Wall Street analysts another record year of earnings in 1997. And I knew we could not achieve those earnings. At the end of the first quarter in 97, we missed the numbers. Uh, we met with Richard. By now, I think six people were involved in the fraud, and we agreed to cook the books again. 
And at the end of the meeting, Richard made eye contact with every one of us. And he said, guys, if we're ever caught, I'm going to deny everything. He says, I don't know what your game plan is, but I will deny everything. By now, I was probably drinking more than I should. I hated my job for the first time in my life. I, I uh, did not enjoy going to work. I felt trapped. I didn't want to be the whistleblower because I knew what Richard was saying. You guys turn on me. I'll bring more lawyers, guns, and money to the party than you will. So uh, in 1997, about September, I left the company. I told Richard I wanted to retire. I said I'd made plenty of money. And I moved to South Alabama. I bought 25 acres of land. I built a very nice house. I had sold all of my health south stock. Uh, I had a tennis court and swimming pool and all kinds of things. I even built a football field in my backyard. I'm not sure why I did that, but I did. About a year after being retired, I got a phone call from Richard. And he said, Aaron, come, come to Birmingham, have lunch with me. I want to talk to you. So I did. I drove up to his corporate office and had lunch with him. And he said, Aaron, come back to work. He said, we're making our numbers fine now. You don't need to worry about that. I want you back on the team. And I told him no. And I drove back home. 1998 passed, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. But in the spring of 2003, I heard that TV announcer say, massive accounting fraud at HealthSouth. I might have just sort of passed out at the time. It was terrible. At this point, it was all in the news. Uh, I knew I needed an attorney. I knew my doorbell was about to ring. It'd probably be the FBI. Uh, called around and hired a, an attorney named Donald Bristman in Mobile. And he said, uh, let me call the feds in Birmingham and uh, I'll call you back before the end of the day. About two hours later, he called back and he said, oh yeah, Mr. Bean, uh, they want to talk to you. You need to be in our office, my office at eight o'clock in the morning. So my wife and I drove to downtown Mobile. And uh, first thing he said was, do not lie to me. Do not lie to the federal government. Your former employees have told them you were involved. The FBI has seized the health self building. If you try to lie your way out of this, you're going to go to prison for a long time. By now, my wife was in tears. I was pretty upset. And it, the meeting was about to end. I asked him if I needed to give him a check, like for a retainer. And he said, yes. And he said, make the check for $100,000. And I said, I hope you're kidding. And that sort of made him mad. He said, yes. And, uh, it won't be the last check you're going to have to write. me." So as I was making out the check, I asked him if I could get a T-shirt or something. And he gave me a coffee mug. Three days later, I was in a federal building in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm sitting across the table from two FBI agents, two agents from the SEC, uh, and a whole room full of attorneys, and I am a scared puppy. It went on all day. I was under oath. It was tape recorded. Uh, and I felt like I didn't do very well because they wanted me to remember details back from uh, 1996. But at the end of the day, the FBI agent said, Mr. Beam, we know a lot about this case. What we can tell today, you've been telling the truth. He said, so far, 17 people have come forward and admitted their involvement in the fraud. He says, only one person, one key person denies knowing anything about it, Richard Scrushy. And we will have to take Mr. Scrushy to trial and we will want you to be a witness. Now, I did not have to go to trial. Uh, I had pled guilty. I was just waiting to be sentenced by a federal judge. But they wouldn't sentence me until the scrutiny trial was over and it didn't begin for two years. So I had two years that were very dark. Now, during these two years, Richard did some pretty interesting things. He spent uh, over $20 million on his legal team. He had seven different law firms. Uh, he had a publicist, he hired a jury selection firm, 
And during that two year period, he began preaching the gospel on television down there in the right hand corner. And he would, uh, every morning at eight o'clock, he'd preach the gospel. And when the trial began, he never entered the courtroom that he didn't have a Bible in his hand. And I thought it was kind of silly. He was obviously trying to taint the jury pool. The government wanted me to be the first witness. They felt like I was very professor-like and I could explain to the jurors what they needed to understand uh, because it's a financial crime. So they put me on the stand and I'm explaining earnings per share, balance sheets. Government's putting up lots of slides, financial slides, and I'm explaining them and they're falling asleep. That night, Richard's attorney said they were not going to take that approach. They were just going to make it fun for the jury. No need to bore them with stuff they couldn't understand. He said, you just need to follow this trial. So the next day, he got me on the stand. He accused me of being an alcoholic, all kinds of things. Uh, and he got in my face and he said, Mr. Bean, when you went to New York City and met with investors, you lied. Mr. Bean, when you presented the numbers to the stockholders and the auditors and the outside board of directors, you lied. You are a cheat. You are a liar. You lie so much you don't know when you're telling the truth. I looked over and the jurors' eyes were wide open. They were paying attention. The trial lasted six months. The jury deliberated for six weeks. Not guilty. All charges. The legal community could hardly believe it. The federal government seldom loses a case like this. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, Martha Stewart, they all went to prison, but not Richard Scrushy. A few days after the trial, Richard held a news conference to announce that he would be flying to Houston, Texas to advise Ken Lay on how to conduct the Enron trial. I was sentenced to prison um, and somehow I was lucky. I only got three months and they sent me to a, a minimum security prison in Montgomery, Alabama. When I got out of prison, I am now a felon. I am a felon today. I will be known as a felon the rest of my life. I did have to pay restitution. I had to sell off my home, uh, all of my major assets to pay restitution, and I needed a job and I could not get a job. So I did what I did when I was 15 years old, I earned my first dollar. So I started mowing lawns and I'm in my sixties. I did it for a couple of years, but finally I gave my first speech at LSU and I didn't realize what I was getting myself into is I broke down and cried several times and almost thought I couldn't finish the speech, but I did. But I didn't think about doing it anymore. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, it all faded from the news. But about this time, something happened, the subprime debacle. We learned that millions of cheater loans were made, and we all know what, how this turned out, how it resulted in the biggest recession since the Great Depression. So I got to thinking, maybe I ought to be doing more of this speaking about ethics. Today, I've spoken to over 100 different universities and given uh, probably close to 1,000 speeches. Why did I do it? This is the cover of Time Magazine in 2009. Why Main Street hates Wall Street. When there's a high level of trust in business, in education, in everything, when there's a high level of trust, things work pretty well. But when you lose that trust, things go south pretty quickly. Enron was voted by Fortune Magazine as the best company in the United States two years in a row. The best company in the United States, Enron. And it just crumbled to the ground. Their accounting firm, the largest firm in the United States, had to go out of business. And the general public is saying, God, is everything rigged? Is everything crooked? And uh, that's why I... I'll speak about ethics today. It is important. One of my favorite um, ethics professors is Dr. Dan Ariely at University. 
and in a book recently, he defined your trust. He talked about trust and he said a society without trust isn't a society. It's a collection of people who are continuously afraid of each other. Think about that. Trust is at the center of all of this. And I think you can see with a lot has been going on in our country now today, uh, the loss of trust is, is tearing the country apart. In 400 AD, St. Augustine said that complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. What was he saying? Basically he's saying that it's easier to try to be perfect than to walk the line, the weekly line of being correct. For example, what is the right moderate amount of texting while you're driving? Zero, you can kill some right. What is the right moderate amount of cheating on your taxes? Zero. What is the right moderate amount of cheating at Vanderbilt University? Zero. Now we're human. We can't be perfect all the time. But when you set your ethical standard below perfect and you rationalize that a moderate amount, a little bit of cheating is okay, you're already on what they call the slippery slope. In 1806, Webster's Dictionary defines success as being generous, prosperous, healthy, and kind. Today, look it up, Webster's today defines success as the attainment of wealth, fame, and rank. We need to go back to the 1806 definition of success. Having more money than your neighbor uh, isn't necessarily a true measure of success. When I look back at what happened to me, uh, my main problem was that I did not have the courage to stand up and do the right thing. And I use that word courage a lot because being ethical takes courage. It's hard work, it's a discipline. Uh, you, you are not just born good or bad. You become what you are by the way you behave. And you have to work at being ethical. And I did not work at it. I did not have the courage to do the right thing. A wise old man was talking to a young boy and he said, there are two wolves always fighting inside of me. One is filled with anger, hate, jealousy, shame, and he lies. The other wolf is filled with love, joy, truth, and peace. This battle rages inside of you and all men. The little boy thought about it for a while and he finally said, which wolf will win? And the man said, the one you feed. This is a very simple little story, but it's really the, the truth of being ethical. You have to feed the good wolf. You have to work at being ethical every day. And it's not easy, and it does take courage. I came across this quote recently, and I think it's very good. Uh, Winston Churchill, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And I think this is true. It's not just a matter of being generous, but in your profession, in what you're doing, are you giving back? Are you doing the correct things? And that's really what life is all about. Let's go to Ethel here. Again, I want want to share with you Ethel. Uh, I think if you go to my website, if I send you my business card, Ethel is on the back side. You do need daily reminders to be ethical. I hope this talk today has is, is, uh, encouraged you to do that. At this point, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. If y'all have any questions, uh, <coughs> is, is, I forget if that was on the agenda or not, a Q&A session. Hello. Um, if Alex Langerman is still on, I would like to hear any thoughts Alex has since you actually do research into ethics. Oh, okay. Alex, any comments?
it's hard to tell. Maybe Alex isn't there anymore. Um, we are actually okay. right right towards the end. Um, I okay. want to thank you very much for your candor, um, for your heartfelt expressions of your experience and guidance for others. Um, that we're deeply appreciative uh, with you sharing your story. Well, thank you. And if somebody does have questions or they want to talk to me, my website is aaronbeam.net. And uh, feel free to contact me and ask me questions. 